Okay, so uh, here we are uh, in uh, um, today's uh, uh, talk in a seminar series of uh, uh, the Institute of Astrophysics. And today we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Frederic Marin. Uh, Frederic uh, obtained his uh, PhD uh, in astrophysics in uh, Strasbourg in 2013. Uh, mostly based on uh, uh, AGN uh, and polarization studies. Um, he was a postdoc then uh, after that uh, in the Czech uh, Academy of Science, uh, studying the Galactic Center. And then he came back to Strasbourg uh, with a, a near C uh, that uh, focused on X-ray polarization measurements. Uh, after that, he got the uh, permanent position in 2019 uh, with the focus of uh, studying X-ray binaries from a multi-wavelength uh, point of view from the far infrared to gamma rays. And today, Frederic is gonna talk us about uh, X-ray polarimetric investigation of uh, active galactic. So Frederic, whenever you are ready, take it away. Thanks, Daniel. So um, my field of study is um, actually active galactic nuclei, mostly. And today I would like to present you the very, very recent results we got in the field of active galactic nuclei, thanks to a completely new observational window, X-ray polarimetry. So this talk is given on behalf of the IXP consortium, which is this new satellite we sent in space two years ago, but I will discuss the IXP mission a bit further down the road. Here, I just want to remind to the audience some very simple concepts about polarization, and in particular, the polarization of a wave. Polarization is a characteristic that is common to all transverse waves, and examples of those transverse waves are, of course, photons, electromagnetic waves, but you can think about waves on the string, the ripples on the surface of water, or many other uh, kind of examples. And if, um, <clears throat> if you take this kind of transverse wave, then oscillation may take place in any direction at right angle to the direction of propagation. And in this case, we just say that it's unpolarized. There is no favorite direction for the oscillation uh, of the um, of the wave, and in the case uh, and in the case you have a very uh, favorite direction for this oscillation, then you will speak about polarization, and that's basically all. You can have different types of polarization. If the oscillation itself takes place in only one direction, this is the top uh, example then the wave is said to be linearly polarized. Doesn't change um, in time, if you integrate for a long time. Uh, the polarization doesn't change for this plane. It's plane polarized in a specific direction. The amplitude of the, uh, the, the resulting vector gives you the polarization degree, how much is polarized from zero to 100%. And the direction of this vector gives you the polarization angle. But during your measurement time, if at each point the oscillation has a constant magnitude and is rotating at a constant rate in the plane perpendicular to the uh, direction of travel, then you will get circular polarization. This is, those are the two extremes of polarization we can measure. And in fact, the most typical polarization we measure is somewhere in between elliptical polarization. But here, what is interesting for us is certainly not a string in space, but rather the photons. Because those are the, uh, the, um, the way to measure something in space, in addition to gravitational waves. And as you all know, the electronic wave consists of both an electric field component and a perpendicular magnetic field component that oscillate in time and right angle. When we discuss polarization measurement in, um, in astrophysics and in most fields, in fact, we always, re, uh, we always discuss the polarization of the electric field. So in which direction is the electric field uh, oscillating? Why? 
Well, because many common electromagnetic wave detectors respond to the electrical forces on electrons in on material and not the magnetic forces. So that's simply why. So in the remaining of this talk, if I discuss, when I, when I speak about polarization, I will always speak about the polarization of the electric field component. But if you want to know the, the polarization of the magnetic field component, well, just apply a plus or minus 90 degrees rotation. And this is interesting because in a source where there is rather strong magnetic field, you have a, um, uh, an extended magnetic field, then you can know the direction, the topology of your magnetic field lines just by looking at the polarization of the electric uh, field components and turn it by 90 degrees. And then you can map your uh, magnetic field here. So why is it interesting to look at the polarization of light? Because we are used to uh, just the pure intensity. We can make spectroscopy, we can make photometry, you can make timing, you can make images with the pure intensity of light. So why looking at this uh, polarization of light? Well, basically many phenomena in space or on Earth will leave their imprint of the, on the photons anytime there is some kind of interaction. If you have a scattering of a photon with let's say an electron or with a dust particle, then the scattering will imprint a specific polarization onto the, the electromagnetic wave, which will be directly related to the composition of your scattering medium. Electron scattering or mis-scattering gives you different wavelengths dependent or wavelengths independent depending on the case signatures. And you can, even if you don't know what is the, it is made of, the polarization will tell you what is the main composition of your medium. You have absorption that can leave uh, absorption, such as absorption line, onto the um, the electric onto the spectroscopy you you make using polarization, so spectral polarimetry. But emission also can leave imprints. Fluorescent lines, as an example, are most of the time unpolarized, but you can have emission. Uh, by the uh, breaking electrons, such as brain channel, which is by itself polarized. You can determine what is the source of emission, physical mechanism for emission in a distant source, even if you are not able to specially resolve it, just by looking at its polarization uh, variation in time. Of course, as I said, strong magnetic field will tend to have an impact onto the polarization itself such as Faraday rotation, which is the rotation of the polarization angle with uh, the distance uh, from the source to the observer in a, in a large scale magnetic field. You can have Zeeman splitting in the emission lines and so on. General relativity is uh, actually imprinting some signatures onto the polarization angle because you have a parallel transport of the polarization angle along the new geodesics in GR. And of course, if you have a, a source that is emitting unpolarized light, such as starlight emission or, or pure formal emission, then you will be diluting your signal. You will leave also another kind of imprint. So by measuring polarization in space, in, in astrophysics, we can determine the composition and morphology of the emitting, scattering, and absorbing region. We can determine the magnetic topology and its turbulence. We can measure effect of general relativity or even detect the presence of invisible objects. I just give you an example on the bottom line, which is here for an exoplanet. You have DH2A, which is a star. And actually, you have on the left the total intensity. You see you are completely dominated by this punctual source. And you can see its exoplanet on the bottom left, D2B. But if you look in polarized intensity, so which is basically the multiplication of the polarization degree times the polarization, the uh, total intensity, you see that the contrast is enhanced. You kill everything that is unpolarized, so you are only left with the uh, real emission region. And as you can see, on the, on the uh, center, you mask the source itself, and you can see a ring, and this ring is actually a ring of dust that is around the, the star. And on the right hand side, you have the vector uh, of polarization. So the polarization degree, the polarization angle that is superimposed. You see a nicely symmetrical feature around the star. And you see the 
one single um, vector onto the exoplanet that tells you in which direction uh, it's rotating and more importantly, it tells you the inclination of the object with respect to the system. So you can get different information in astrophysics thanks to uh, polarization. Polarization is an important phenomenon. It has been observed in astronomy for the sun, for quasars, and this will be the topic of our, our discussion today, for cosmic microwave backgrounds, for exoplanets, for basically everything. Here you have typically the polarization measurement over the full sky that, is, that shows the orientation of the polarization, and then it follows the uh, large scale magnetic field in the galactic plane. And it's extremely interesting because we have we can then see something which is completely invisible. Of course, it's clearly not an easy uh, process. Measuring polarization needs dedicated instruments, parameters, and dedicated knowledge. It's not as easy to reduce total flux images uh, with uh, polarized, polarized images. It's more complex. But it's worth it, especially if you look at active galactic nuclei. It has been one of the most important tools ever for this very spe uh, specific field. For you who are not familiar uh, with active galactic nuclei, we are just speaking at basically quasi-stellar radio astronomical sources, quasars. They have been discovered uh, half a century ago, and they, on a typical um, observation in the optical light, they, observe, they are observed as a point-like source, just as a star. But actually, if you look in the radio or the web bands, you can also see big giant uh, jets with huge lobes, which indicate that there is something happening. It's clearly not a star. And from redshift measurement, and then from, from the advance of radio, optical, and other wave band uh, with satellites and ground-based telescopes, we, uh, we were able to determine that actually, Quasars, or basically active galactic nuclei, I will use this term, AGM, are simply the very, very bright herd of galaxies which are outshining by a factor of one or a factor thousands uh, the starlight emission from the host galaxy. They are extragalactic objects. And what we believe is that, as seen on this unifying shim here, there is at the center a supermassive black hole, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 for the most extreme, extreme case, a solar masses black hole. This black hole is accreting matter in the form of an accretion disk, an accretion structure, that uh, because of its viscosity and its, um, its um, spiral motion will create thermal emission in the disk. The disk itself will emit from the uh, outer border in the infra, uh, uh, near infrared to the UV band in, the, in close to the event horizon of the black hole. Further uh, down the, the disk, the disk may be fragmented and gives rise to a region which is called the broadline region, responsible for the emission of uh, broad lines we see in uh, optical spectra. And then we have a big reservoir of dust and gas, which is called the circumnuclear region or the torus, which is basically hiding the central engine from an observer situated along the edge of the system. Because of this, uh, the shape of the torus, we expect that there is on the polar regions, the ejections of both the jets and the wings. The jets are collimated, relativistic uh, particles sent uh, way, way outside of the galaxy itself, and uh, they are responsible for the radio loudness. So you can see it on the spectral energy distribution. You have a strong component in the radio, which is, which is associated with synchrotron emission from the jets. But not all AGN have jets. Some of them are radio quiet. They are basically the same object, it's, um, of course, a simplification here, but they are basically the same object without jets. They do have ejection winds in the forms of ionized winds, which slowly um, mix with the interstellar medium to become the narrow line regions responsible for the narrow emission lines in the optical spectrum. 
And because uh, AGN are highly um, asymmetric objects, as you can see from the equatorial plane or the polar, pl the polar direction, they are totally different in geometry. And thus, in uh, observational signatures, the edge on system, which we call the type two system, is basically blocked. The view is blocked by the dust. So you don't see the central engine. And it's very dim with respect to the polar view, the type one view, where you have a direct access to the system, to the supermassive black hole and its closed environment. So what is interesting is that polarization is directly linked with anisotropy. Everything that is not, access, uh, is not symmetric will produce polarization. And thus, we do expect polarization from the AGM. And the thing, everything that I have explained to you is our current view of AGM, simplified, of course. But this everything is based on one observation that was done in the 80s for one of the most uh, iconical sources, NGC 1068, because at first, we strongly believe that quasars so radio loud AGN and radio poet AGN were totally different objects. And type one and type twos were also totally different objects. And in fact, looking at the total flux image, so the bottom spectrum, you see the optical uh, spectrum in, to in total intensity, and you see narrow emission lines. So this was classified as a type two object. But if you look, on the top, on the bottom, uh, no, on the top panel, if you look at the polarized flux, you see that the H alpha and H beta line are very broad. They are much, much broader than in the total flux spectrum. And this indicates, in fact, that there is a type one, spec, uh, type one object inside the type two. It's just hidden from the observer because of the dust. And what you see is just photons scattering onto the polar winds towards then the equatorial observer as a periscopic view. And this was the beginning of our real understanding of AGN. AGN are basically one big class of objects and orientation, the inclination of the system with respect to you plays a huge role in determining what will be the observational signatures. And this was achieved thanks to polarimetry. Yet, you would expect that because of this, um, this discovery, we should have observed AGN and basically all objects from the radio to the gamma rays in polarization. But focusing on AGN, you have here in this 1068, the object that has been the most observed ever in polarization. On the top, you have the polarization degree, the middle panel is the polarized flux, and the bottom panel is the polarization angle. And as you can see, we have probed this source, bright and nearby, radio quiet, from the UV to basically the radio. We have gaps because it's not very bright in radio, so we have very little points. For radio loud objects, we have much more points, but they are highly variable in time because of synchrotron emission. But what is striking is that the high energy band the, is completely empty of measurement. And this is the most observed ever AGN in polarization. All the other sources have far less points of measurement. So as you can see, in the far UV, X-rays, and gamma rays, there is a completely uncharted realm. And this is what we will discuss today. Let's look at AGN with X-ray parametry. Yes, but there is a problem. The previous plot I showed you is half a century worth of observation with many different telescopes, ground based on satellites. But there is nothing for X-ray parametry. In fact, X-ray parametry has just been achieved for one object, the Cram Nebula. You see on the top view, uh, the top panel, panels, the, the um, top um, row, the top row, the different total flux images of this uh, Cram Nebula. And as you can see from the radio to the X-rays, we see different components as we go for high energy, we go towards the center, we see different structures, 
where the emission is, uh, is created. We see tori, we see ejection winds, which is shocks and so on. And the same object has been observed in polarization, in the radio, in the infrared, in the optical, but in the X-rays, it wasn't only observed in the 70s, and we only got one total flux, uh, one, one um, integrated measurement over the world field of view, no imaging, only one point at a few keV. And this is due to the fact that we never had an X-ray parametry, uh, an X-ray parameter since the 70s. And the 70s parameter were only sufficient, sensitive enough for the Crumb Nebula. That's all. So if you look at a historical perpendicular, just to give you a better idea of how complicated and how um, empty is the field of X-ray parametry, this is the number of X-ray satellites with time. From the beginning of the history of X-ray astronomy with uh, rock sounding rockets to nowadays, very big te uh, telescopes and observatories. And as you can see over the several decades, well, we have an almost constant number of X-ray satellites. But X-ray satellite with a parameter, we got two in the 70s, which only got one measurement of the Crumb uh, Nebula. That's all. In the past decade, we got the uh, CZTI instrument on board of the Indian AstroSat uh, satellite, which is made for hard gamma rays of GRBs, and basically that's all, with also uh, some very nice uh, atoms to look at the Crumb Nebula, but that's it. And this decade, two years ago, we launched the IMSP satellite. So why? Why were we depraved? Why were we be missing those X-ray parameters? Well, there is multiple arguments why there is no X-ray satellites equipped with an X-ray parameter. And the, the, this, those arguments hold for gamma ray polarization too. First, X-ray parametry needs rotation, means movable part. Indeed, you need to measure the uh, vectorial quantity. And to fully characterize a vector, you need to rotate your instrument at different angles to get all the information about the angle and the, the uh, polarization degree. But nowadays, X-ray satellites have no uh, needs for movable parts, especially a full, um, a full instrument that is, move, uh, that is moving. If it's easy to do with uh, crystals or with beer infusion crystals in the optical band, it's terribly complicated and expensive in space in X-rays. And what is we usually say is that technologically, it is less advanced than spectroscopy timing on imaging in X-rays. And that's true. I mean, it has not been developed for 40 years. Of course, X-ray parametry is certainly not as developed as those other techniques. And the final argument is that polarized fluxes are often much lower than total fluxes. And that's logical. You are measuring the polarized flux, and the polarized flux is a fraction between zero and, and one of the total flux. So it needs longer integration time to have the same sensitivity, the same signal to noise ratio than in total flux. But everything changed in the early 20,000 uh, uh, year, 20,000, because a team of Italian collaborators led by Enrico Costa and, um, and Bellazzini developed a new device to measure the X-ray polarization in a very efficient way. This is called the gas pixel detector. You have here uh, a real picture on the right and the uh, schematic of this uh, instrument. It's extremely simple. It relies on the photoelectric effect. This is a two centimeter by two centimeter detector, very cheap to produce. And it's comprised of a, a box with a window on the top that will filter uh, low energy uh, photons and leave the uh, X-rays pass through the window. The X-ray inside the box will interact with a gas, a gaseous mixture. And by photoelectric effect, it will photoionize the gas. It will give rise to secondary photoelectrons. We will continue to pho photoionize the gas. So third uh, tertiary photoelectrons and so on and so on. So you will multiply your uh, signal and you will collect all the photoelectrons onto a pixelized anode on the bottom. 
And what is very clever is that the photoelectric effect gives in memory, uh, keeps in memory the incident polarization of the X-ray. So what you do is you measure the traces left by the photoelectric effect into the gas by your incident polarized X-rays. And this is on the left, a typical trace in your detector. As you can see, you have a point of impact where there is a lot of energy deposited. And then there is a motion of your uh, stream of photoelectrons towards the direction. And this direction is the polarization angle. You have a pixelized anoid, and so you integrate uh, in 360 degrees, and you get the signal modulation. Many, many traces are going in the same direction, then you will have a nice sinusoidal. If all traces are going in a random direction, you will have a flat uh, modulation and thus no polarization. And that's all. You have here the typical 100 polarized radiation on the left and unpolarized radiation on the right. And what is interesting is that the, uh, the parameter phi gives you the polarization angle. And to get the polarization degree, you just have to measure the, um, uh, the height of the sinusoid with respect to the bottom, to the, the background, which is the letter A on the bottom here. It means also that you have a very nice way to remove all background, unpolarized background, uh, instrumental background from your detector by doing this modulation. And you are left with, a, with an equipment, with an instrument, with zero instrumental background. Everything you record is polarized, or it's totally unpolarized, and then you have zero polarization. So we have a very efficient uh, technology now that is able to do polarization measurement. And because we are using a pixel as a node in X and Y direction, it means that we can do imaging for free because we have the point of impact of your incident polarized uh, photon. So the gas pixel detector does spectroscopy, imaging, and of course, timing, because you collect at a given rate the, um, the photoelectrons. So you do everything at once with this kind of instrument. So we have completely killed the two first arguments. And there is one remaining argument, which is the fact that it needs long integration time. And unfortunately, this is something that will never be, um, uh, that will never, we will never overcome. This is something which is intrinsically linked with polarization. You are measuring fluxes, which are by definition, less intense than total fluxes. So you will need more integration time. But for you, if you ask yourself the question, how much more time? Then you just have to think about the minimum detectable polarization you expect, the level of, uh, over which we can reject the hypothesis of the absence of polarization and 99% confidence level. So if you are sure that your source has, uh, you want to reach a minimum detectable polarization of 1%, everything you measure that is higher than 1% is at 99% confidence level uh, true. And below that, you simply cannot trust your signal. So if you, in the X-rays, if you want to uh, detect a source in, um, with photometry, typically an AGN, you need 10 cons. 10 cons in X-rays is enough to say, OK, there is a source at this place in the sky. If you want to measure a spectral slope, such as a polar low, again for AGN, 100 cons is enough to have a rough estimation of the polar low uh, spectral index. But if you want to measure 1% minimum detectable polarization, you need more than 700,000 cons. It's huge. It's tremendous. And for this very reason, we cannot plug an X-ray parameter on board of, let's say, XML Newton, Athena, or whatever big X-ray observatory, because it needs a dedicated mission that will point for very long times on a specific object. And you cannot ask a big observatory that needs two kiloseconds or 10 kiloseconds to say for one megasecond on the same source just to get X-ray polarization. We need a dedicated mission. And this is what we did. 
The goals for scientific, uh, the scientific goals for X-ray parametry are numerous, and it concerns not only AGN but every field, every object in the uh, in the sky. You can look at pulsar, wind nebula, supernova remnant, and jets, both in blazars or microquasars, to look at acceleration phenomena. You can look at emission in strong magnetic fields around white dwarfs or magnetars and so on. You can look at scattering in asymmetrical geometries, perfect for X-ray binaries and AGNs, or the galactic center, but you can also do fundamental physics, such as quantum electrodynamics, GR effect, or looking for supersymmetric particles and axions. The uh, complete wave band, uh, energy band, to, uh, to do so, one can be divided in three, three basic bands. The very soft X-rays below 1 keV, the soft X-rays between 1 and 10, and the hard X-rays larger than 10 keV. All those uh, scientific goals can be probed, but some of them uh, suffer from heavy absorption below 1 keV, and some of them are not bright enough after 10 keV. So the sweet spot to do X-ray parametry is in the 1 to 10 keV band. So again, this is what we did. Uh, on, um, <clears throat> on December uh, the 21st, the 2021st, we launched the ISP mission, the Imaging X-ray Parametry Explorer, which is a small explorer mission undertaken by NASA in partnership with Italian Space Agency. You see the launch that happened two years ago here. It was launched on the Falcon 9 rocket from the Kennedy Space Flight Center to a, an altitude of 600 kilometers in equatorial orbit. It has a zero degree inclination to minimize the times spent above the South Atlantic anomaly so that we have the minimal uh, particle background in the detector. The launch was successful and everything has been up to date. We took two three weeks for uh, calibration, because we have calibration source on board. And then we started to do science in January last year. IXP is this mission. It was 244 million mission. So basically very small explorer mission, very, very cost efficient. It weighs a bit more than 300 kilograms. It has a deployable uh, boom which um, uh, reach 5.2 um, meters once uh, deployed. The nominal lifetime of the mission was two years, but there is no life uh, limiting consumables on board. So we are in space for about eight years, and then the satellite will enter the Earth's atmosphere due to the decaying orbit after that. The energy band is uh, 2 to 8 keV. It has a field of view because it can do imaging, as I said, of about 12.9 arc minutes square with a resolution, a special resolution of about 28 arc second at 4.5 keV. It is able to do uh, spectroscopy uh, with an energy resolution of 0.52 keV at 2 keV. And of course, it depends on the square root of energy. And you can do timing at the order of a microsecond. The IXP long-term plan is here, shown here, with all the sources we have observed for the past almost two years, one year and a half. You can see, you can look if um, your favorite sources are here. But basically, we have explored all sources in the sky which emit uh, bright X-rays, with the exception of the sun, because the sun will clearly, uh, it will destroy the IXP uh, detectors because it's too bright. We haven't done moon, uh, the Earth, and uh, planets of the uh, stellar system um, of the um, stellar system of the solar system uh, because they are not bright enough. But here, as you can see, we have observed uh, several radio quiet AGN as well also at the galactic center and several radio loud and blazars. So. What have we learned from RXP? First, let's look at blazars. It was one of the first objects we pointed the telescope towards because blazars are extremely bright in X-rays. So short amount of time spent on a source. And blazars are AGNs which launch oppositely directed pairs of collimated powerful jets. 
as I said, with our radio lord AGMs. But the thing is that their inclination is directly pointing towards the Earth. So the jets, we see the inside of the jet. We are in the same direction of those uh, accelerated particles. The thing is that how do you energize particles up to the almost the uh, speed of light? This is very elusive. So one of the answer could be uh, probed by polarimetry. The thing is that we don't know the ratio of matter and antimatter in the jet. We have seen various um, emission behaviors among blazars. Some of them have a high cyclotron peak in the UV and some other low cyclotron peak in the infrared, and that give rise to inverse Compton scattering to uh, the basically the X-ray gamma ray band emission. But all of this requires also, because of synchrotron emission and collimated uh, jets, magnetic field, which are somewhat probably ordered over a long, long distance. And uh, we need to know the magnetic field direction relative to the uh, jet axis. Otherwise, our models are very uh, have a lot of hard time to make predictions. And there are several models to decipher the physical mechanisms responsible for X-ray and gamma ray emissions. And this is strongly related to the jet composition and magnetic field topology. There are many models, but four of them has been studied quite extensively. To explain the emission of X-rays, then you can have the single zone model. It's, it's very simple, the most simple of, the, of those. It's a plasmoid with partial uh, ordered or helical magnetic field that accelerate particles at highly uh, high speeds through the volume. So basically everything is constant here. But of course, this is very naive, a simplistic approach, very good for the first order approximation. But if you want to be a bit more specific, you can go for multi-zone model. Here you have a turbulent magnetic field with magnetic field reconnections when continued region of oppositely directed magnetic field come into contact. And because of magnetic field reconnection, you, you get those flashes of X-rays and gamma rays and probably other, at other weapons too. You have another model, which is the energy stratified model where the particles become energized over a limited volume at a sharp front or by magnetic reconnection. We don't know one of the two, maybe. And then they advect or diffuse away from that region. So basically, the electrons lose energy to radiation, and they emit at progressively decreasing frequencies. So you will expect the X-ray and optical and infrared emission not to be specially collocated, but likely to be slightly separated with respect to the radial distance to the supermassive black holes. All those models have specific signatures in polarization. They have uh, some chromaticity, so there could be very little change from the radio to the gamma ray in terms of polarization, low chromaticity, or on the opposite, they, have, they could be very different polarization degree with respect to the two opposite sides of the electromagnetic spectrum. The variability of the polarization can be as of a day, even hours, but it can go to uh, months, few weeks, no problem. And then the polarization angle is different depending on the magnetic topology. It could have a random orientation. It could be along the jet axis or perpendicular to the jet axis. And so far, up to IXP, we didn't know what was the correct uh, model. So what we have done is that we have observed Markian 501. It's a blazer, a Bialak object, at nearby redshift. And actually, it, has a, it is among the brightest sources in the skies at the gamma ray regime. So it was a perfect source. We observed it for 100 uh, kiloseconds and, and then another time for 86 kiloseconds uh, in uh, 2021 and uh, in 2022, sorry. And this is what we see. Uh, this is what we saw. On the left, you see the, the uh, field of view of IXP with the central punctual object. That's fine. And the polarization degree was found to be coherent between the two observations, so very little variation despite the known variability of the subject. And it was about 10% polarization degree with the polarization angle of 144 degrees. OK, what does it tell you? It tells you that the polarization angle is parallel to the radio jet. That's a strong hint first. 
And then to determine the chromaticity of, the, uh, of this blazer in particular, at the same time we did the XP observation, we made radio, or uh, infrared and optical polarization measurement. And what we found is that the polarization degree is increasing towards higher frequency, and the polarization angle remains completely constant and always aligned with the jet axis. So thanks to all this information, we, we did put our Sherlock Holmes hat and we just look at all the clues. So strong chromaticity, slow variability, and um, polarization angle along the jet axis. Ta-da! We have once for all determined that, at least in the case for Markian 501, X-ray emissions results from an energy stratified jet where the X-ray emission is due to shocks. A blob of plasma is just colliding with the, small, uh, with the slower blob that was emitted um, uh, earlier on, and the two collides, there is a shock at the front of the plasmoid, X-ray emission, and all of this is due, uh, is, um, is, has been uh, taught to us by X-ray polarization. What is interesting here is that uh, the high energy particles likely emit from magnetically ordered regions close to the acceleration site. So you will tell me, okay, Markan 501, one, da one data, one point of observation is not enough. And you're right. We observed Markan 501 several times. The same um, results always appear. We did it also for Markan uh, 421. Exactly the same thing. Strong chromaticity, polarization uh, degree, high and aligned with the jets. No variation in time for the polarization degree. And I am not allowed to show you the result, but we did it for several other high sequence peak blazers, and we always find the same, uh, the same data. But those are still under embargo, so I cannot talk about them. But there is not only two sources down more. However, and this is where things become very interesting, for low synchrotron peak blazers, where the synchrotron peak is basically in the infrared, near infrared, such as BLAC itself, 3C273, 3C279, and so on, we detected no polarization. It was always extremely low and maximum monopole limit. And this tells us something already. It tells us that there are fundamental differences between high cyclotron peak blazers and low cyclotron peak blazers. And those were not expected. The X-ray, they are certainly not emitted by the same mechanism. And if not the same mechanism is responsible for X-ray emission, likely uh, you have differences in the jet itself, itself. So we are continuing to observe this, those sources. But of course, uh, we didn't look only at radio loud AGNs. We looked at their low energy cousins, the safer galaxies. Those are exactly as, uh, well, they are at first order, exactly as quasars are radio loud AGNs with a very high surface brightness and strong ionization emission line. But unlike these, um, the quasars, which are very high energy, uh, high, uh, which are very strong, um, which dominate in terms of flux, the their host galaxy, in case of safer galaxies, the starlight of the host galaxies is most of the time approximately equal to the amount of light of the bolometric uh, emission of the AGN itself. But what is interesting here is that those safer galaxies are AGN without radio jets, who are not polluted by the synchrotron emission. And we can have a deep look at the central engine if we look at type 1 AGNs. Here you have an example of Saxonus galaxy, a type 2 AGN. So we don't see the, the core itself because it's hidden behind uh, uh, optically thick dusty torus. But of course, at first, you want to look at safer ones the polar ones, where you have the direct view towards the central engine. So what we did is we looked at MCG 523.16. It is the brightest in X-rays, safer one galaxy. It is very nearby, and it has broad emission line detected in near infrared spectropolarimetry. 
We don't see a broad emission line in the optical band. It tells us that the, the source is likely inclined. And the more inclined it is, the best it is for polarization because it's more asymmetric. We observed it for almost 500 kiloseconds in 2022, and we found only an upper limit. The polarization degree is likely below 4.7%, and of course the polarization degree in this case is totally unconstrained. Okay. That was disappointing. It was the brightest source. We spent half a million seconds and nothing. What it what the, the total flux spectrum and the polarization, uh, the upper limit on the polarization tells us that maybe, maybe we can put some kind of constraint on the X-ray emission itself. In uh, safer galaxies, we believe that the X-ray emission is due to a hot corona of electrons that is situated somewhere around the supermassive black hole and its accretion disk. Is it on top of it? It is along the polar axis? Is it along the equatorial axis? We don't know. We have no idea. Yet, uh, we know that the thermal emission, so UV emission, is reprocessed by this X-ray corona up to the X-ray band by inverse Compton scattering. But we have different models. Here you see the bottom panel, uh, three different resolution of the same uh, central engine, same parametrization, but different geometries of the corona. Either a slab, so basically on the, uh, along the equatorial plane, a sphere, which is uh, a, like um, a completely englobing the AG, the supermassive black hole and part of the accretion disk, or a cone, so basically along the polar direction. And you see the IXP limits, but uh, limits nothing. So it was disappointing. At least uh, we decided to run an, uh, an additional 700 kilosecond on the source. The paper has been submitted now, but I can tell you that we again detected nothing, despite 1.2 megasecond on the object. So it was a big disillusion for us. There is something clearly we don't understand because at this kind of inclination, we should have detected polarization. But we continued our quest and we looked at another very, very bright Seyfert one, NGC 4151, among the bright, brightest Seyfert galaxies in the local universe, which has an optical type which is between 1.5 and 1.8. This is called a changing look AGN. And uh, in this case, we see the broad line. So it tells us that the system is less or uh, inclined with respect to the observer, but we, we tried. We just wanted to spend 700 kiloseconds on this. And we were very, very uh, little uh, optimistic, but still, we wanted to check. And with the 700 kiloseconds, we found, we measured a polarization degree of 4.9% plus or minus 1.1% with an electric vector polarization angle, the polarization angle at 86 plus or minus seven degrees. Okay, that was completely unexpected. And even more, if you see here on this plot, the uh, realize, the measurement uh, in black is the integrated 2 to 8 keV, so the 4.9% I told you at 86 degrees. Then you can also see that we could make energy dependent measurements between 2 and 3.5 keV, 3.5 and 5, and 5 to 8 keV. And we see that the polarization degree increases with energy, and the polarization angle is more or less constant. This, is, this was absolutely not expected. At best, you would expect that the polarization degree decreases with energy because of multiple scattering. But no, it's the opposite. That's, that was a marvelous um, discovery. But what was more important even was the polarization angle. The X-ray polarization angle is actually parallel to the direction of the extended radio emission. It's parallel to the parsec scale jet in NGC 4151, a small aborted jet. But still, there is some kind of synchrotron emission here. What does it tell us? It tells us a lot. You have here different models for the X-ray corona. You see that it could be Along the polar axis, you have the on the top right and left, you see two realization, which is basically the base of the jet, and the other one just a lamppost on the top, uh, on the vertical axis of the spinning black hole. 
but you can have also equatorial um, equatorial corona. So it could truncate the disc at a certain distance, or it could be like a sandwich on top of the, of the disc, or it can be also just patch, patches, uh, clouds on top of the disc. We don't know. And the thing is that because you found, we found a parallel polarization means that the corona must be along the equatorial plane. If it was along the polar direction, it would have been perpendicular. The polarization would have been perpendicular to the radio jet. So we could remove a full family of model thanks to the observation. We have dismissed a model that was used since the, I don't remember, the, it's basically the um, Ross and Fabian model for the X-ray corona, the geometry, which basically we have proven wrong and we are using it for decades. We know now that for AGNs, and actually it was also proven with much higher statistics for X-ray binaries, the same thing, the X-ray corona in AGN is along the equatorial plane not along the polar direction. After these very strong results, we also wanted to look at safer tools. And we looked at one of the brightest, the Circinus galaxy, also very close, which is Compton Fink, where the line of sight of the observer crosses the dusty torus. And it has a hydrogen column density in excess of 10 to the 25 atom per centimeter square. We, we also put 700, uh, more than 700 kilosecond on the, on the AGN, and we found a high polarization degree, more than 17%, with a uh, polarization angle that is perpendicular to the radio structure, as expected for safer tools. Because here you have perpendicular scattering onto the polar axis towards the observer, periscopic view, high polarization degree, because it's... Um, uh, the polarization degree is uh, proportional to the cosine square of the scattering angle. So clearly here we have reflection, either by the torus or by the winds, and spectral decomposition by, uh, from the um, XMM and um, XMM data and new star data tells us that it's very likely scattering onto the dusty torus. Nicely, this kind of, um, this kind of uh, data tells us that the aging inclination mm, basically should be around 60 degrees. And it gives you a half opening angle for the torus of 45, 50 degrees with respect to the equatorial plane. All of this from uh, numerical modeling, modeling of x ray polarization. But here, we are in complete tension with optical and infrared observation. In fact, if you look at mid-infrared in interferometry or infrared and optical polarization imaging, we find by, let's say, the work of Marco Stalewski and collaborator that in Succinus, in infrared and optical, the half opening angle of the torus should be of the order of 10 degrees. It should be very thin along the equatorial plane. And the aging inclination must be very, very inclined, up to eight, more than 80 degrees, in order to reproduce the interferometry and total flux images in infrared and optical. Optical parametry does not agree either. In X-rays, we are at 17%, and in the optical, at 25%. And the two, because they come from the same scattering region, and because they are due mainly to uh, electron scattering, should be the same, should be very similar in terms of uh, polarization degree. So it tells us that there is something we, are, we have not understood yet in the case of safer two AGNs, and in particular, about the true geometry of the equatorial obscure. So this is something that we are still investigating. So as a conclusion, because uh, sorry, it was a bit long, parametry is an essential tool to probe celestial bodies and EGN in particular. We have opened a completely new observational windows thanks to IXP in 2022, and it will fly for the foreseeable future, maybe 2028, a bit more probably. So far, the XPE consortium, which is a closed consortium, you don't have access, you cannot uh, join us to observe the source you want. Uh, I've observed one new galaxy, Centaurus A, but it was a very poor upper limit. 
many Blazars, and four Radio Kuwait AGMs. I haven't spoken about EC 4329A because the paper has just been submitted. But unfortunately, I just tell you that it was an upper limit. All of those objects require big amount of time, more than 700 kiloseconds, and they are the brightest objects. So imagine if you want to do that for less bright AGMs. But the results we got are still amazing. X-ray generation in high quantum blazars are due to shocks in the jets. And high quantum blazars and low quantum blazars clearly have different physical phenomena to produce X-rays. The X-ray corona is a long equatorial plane. It's not a long post geometry as we did for the last decades. There are new methods now to estimate the inclination, but see, we see that those are in tension with optical infrared uh, observations. However, next year, RXP will become an observatory. You will be able to use uh, to, to make proposals. So if you are interested by this kind of science for AGNs, but also for X-ray binaries, for supernova remnant, or any uh, high energy sources bright enough, contact me. It is uh, better to have a co uh, member of the XP consortium as a co -I, and I can direct to you to the correct person for contact for your respect, uh, respective field of research. Until then, I thank you a lot for your attention. I will be very happy to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. So uh, it was very nice talk. Uh, and I'm sure we have uh, several questions from our uh, polarization experts here. Uh, Sifix, I think you are. Uh, you have your hand. Please go ahead. Hi, Frederic. How are Hello, you? Yosef. Nice to see you. Good to see you indeed. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm not. I'm not an expert on polarimetry, um, but um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions about 4151, of course. Um, uh, very strong statements there from you. Um, and I have a few uh, comments there. Uh, first of all, it's the field of view, right? I mean, the, the resolution. Why do you think that what you're measuring comes just from the corona? It's not just scattering from the torus. You mm -hmm. have a huge, um, uh, you can't really pinpoint, it's not Chandra, right? You can't really pinpoint the X-ray source. Mind you, NGC 4151 is highly absorbed in X-rays, right? So you're absolutely right. We don't have the spatial resolution. We didn't use imaging at all for the safer galaxies because we cannot resolve anything. Those are just points in at the central uh, pixel of the detector. So from that point of view, we don't discuss spatial resolution at all. We integrated over the whole field of view. What we did, however, is that we decomposed the, the spectrum, the X-ray spectrum, of taken by RXP with exactly contemporaneous, um, simultaneous, sorry, observation by XMM and, um, and uh, New Star. So we have a full view and we decompose the signal. So to be sure about what we were looking at. And we saw that in the case of IXP, the contribution of reflection with respect to direct emission was very negligible. So we are sure that it's not scattering um, only on the torus, let's say. Scattering on the torus has an impact. We have used that, we decomposed it, but clearly this polarization comes from the continuum source itself, the direct source. Sorry, uh, you, you, the torus I understand. What if you have uh, the, the, you know, uh, when you look at 1068, Miller and Donucci, there, the scattering comes from electrons that are above yes. the central source. If this is happening to you, you can't tell. You can, actually. You cannot can. even tell from X-ray uh, spectrum, right? Because they act as a mirror. You're right. Uh, from the X-ray spectrum in total intensity, you can't. You're right. We should perhaps wait a little bit longer because this is not a clean source. This is not a source where, you know, let's say you don't have, it's, you just see the core, right? Okay. Yeah. In that it's, case, I would say that perhaps you may wait a little bit longer until you start saying that, oh, right, okay, yes. And in fact, by the way, 4151 is one of the sources where the UV optical lags compared to X-rays are very well determined. And if you have a source that is there in the middle of the plane, how does it, call, how does it talk to the disk? I fully agree. Uh, I, I perfectly, 
we know each other and we I know what you work on. So yeah, no, 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 no. I think I think it's extremely important. Yes. I find yes. the IC 4329A result very interesting because we had a talk last week. Mm -hmm. by, um, uh, I but think let me precise the uh, few things yeah. here. You're yeah. right. Um, in many things, it's a complicated source with many absorption. In the soft band, yeah. there is a it's complex a absorption, a multiple absorber. That's I, a mess. I fully, I fully I agree. agree. Yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is that. But however, what is for sure is that we are not scattering onto the wind or onto an extended region. Otherwise, the polarization angle will be different. But more important, importantly, from purely NGC 4151, I would never make such a strong statement as their lump post geometry is dead. From NGC 4151 only, this is not strong enough. It's one source. The statistic is not terribly good enough. Actually, I, think, I, I agree However, with you that X-ray polarimetry is extremely important because it can put such strong, um, you know, um, um, some strong, you know, um, um, let's yeah. say, um, geometrical constraints constraints right yeah. but when you have mcg and actually after 1.2 it's consistent with zero so fantastic for the lamp post and actually an issue now for the uh for the um, extended emission because this is 1.9 it has to be quite you know inclined quite yeah. inclined so you know if you actually do a little bit more and put even stronger um constraints on mcg then maybe it's the other geometry that is dead. So why I am so strong about this statement is that not shown here, but I, I can show it later on or we can discuss it. We did the same measurement for X-ray binaries, Cygnus X1 and many others. And in all cases where the X-ray emission was due to the corona itself and not due to the jet, we found always the same thing, the polarization angle, was always uh, parallel to the direction of the extended, extended radio jet, and the polarization degree was always acting exactly as in NGC 4151, increasing with energy. Which and is because exactly, we believe, I agree, yeah. I would agree. So that's why from NGC 4151, this is not enough to have a strong, 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 uh, and decisive conclusion. But I, but I do this in light of the all X surveys with where we have. Uh, uh, significance more than 10, 11, 13 for the polarization measurements. And the where problem, the problem with 4151 and other AGN is the UV. You need the disc. You cannot have a hot thing in there because then you cannot explain. That's exactly the whole difference between those binaries, which are in the hard state, and mm -hmm. you can't see the disc, right? Oh, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. In it, this is not a low luminosity HN. This is not a liner in which no, certainly not. Probably the disk is not there. You know, it's you have a hot flow in the middle. In those HN, the the, the ciphered ones, the bright ones, you have a strong UV emission. You need the disk. The moment you take out, right? Okay, your inner disk. You That's a problem. If you start to full, truncate your disk, where does this UV come your from? Full SED. That's that's the problem, right? Absolutely. That's we clearly need. So, in fact, for NGC 4151, it's a very nice object because uh, we need. It, it would be perfect to have at the same time the X-ray and UV and optical polarization uh, at the same time, and you will learn a lot from this. Uh, but the, I, I I agree, but but. Okay, we can discuss. But we know, we know how important UV is to determine what's happening in ciphers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great talk. Thanks, thanks for the week. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any questions? Dimitri? Yes. Uh, hello, Frederick. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I have also recently seen that you had a um, some interesting result about the galactic center, um, mm -hmm. yes. position, but you haven't said anything about this. Maybe you can tell us a couple of words about it. No, I can't. It's under embargo until June the 21st. <laughs> oh. But okay, well, out of you. the recording, um, in, in the sense that I, I will not show you anything, 
But I can tell you that we observe the galactic center with our XP for more than a megasecond. And we, uh, in the quest of determining where does the observed X-ray emission from the giant molecular clouds come from. And actually, we have very strong hint that very likely, such as a star, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, was active in the past. When, for how long, we don't know. What was the luminosity at that time, the flux, we don't know. And what we believe is that we see on the giant molecular clouds, which are situated a few parsecs away, up to 100 parsecs away from such as a star, the reflection, the echo of the X-ray emission. But the X-ray emission of the continuum is long gone, but the echo is still ongoing. And this is what we looked at. And I can tell you that we actually detected uh, polarization from the giant, the, those giant molecular clouds. And from this polarization, we were able to put a constraint onto the 3D location of the scattering region, then to go back to the period when in, in the past it was active, for how long, and what was the luminosity. I can give you the exact number. It's under embargo, but at least I can tell you that it was at least as bright as a safe earth, clearly. But uh, well, you, you will have to wait for the June the 21st to have the full uh, story. OK, thank you. Sounds like very interesting. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else with questions? Looks like um, there are not. Uh, just a, a curiosity. I mean, I think you you said it, but uh, this uh, uh, IXP will be up there up until twenty twenty eight. Something like that. Uh, the end date is not known yet. It depends on NASA uh, funding. But what is for sure, it will be extended towards the next year, two years, and likely it will stay until twenty twenty eight maximum 2030 okay but I mean, it's it's very likely i mean it's a there is no cost involved except for the people at the um, the yeah. uh, telemetry base now so it's very low cost mission it should be it should be here until the end of the decade and uh, the open calls will be yearly as in in a, in a year yes we are currently working on this in the consortium and we are defining how, uh, how to make it properly, what are the constraints and so on. But of course, there will be public calls. Everything will be uh, on the regular websites to, uh, to use IXP. Mm -hmm. And one uh, also curiosity about the, is there any uh, uh, galactic source that you can clearly resolve uh, and you have polarization maps for? Yes. Yes, the supernova remnant in particular. But we also have a polarization map of the galactic center. Yeah. But uh, supernova remnants are clearly the, the targets uh, that we are looking at because we, it's we can see the, the shock fronts at the uh, edges of the bubble mm -hmm. and also the pulsar wind nebulae, the crab in, part in particular. Are there any results already about those? Yes, uh, you for the crab, I'm not sure it is yet. Uh, it's probably still under embargo for the imaging of the crab, but for the for the um, for the uh, supernova remnant, you have two papers already. One is on Cas A, Cassiope A, which uh, was a bit uh, disappointing, but uh, we have a very good results on Tico. And all of those two papers has, have been published. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure uh, people will find it interesting. Okay. If there is no more questions, I think we can uh, stop here uh, the recording. Uh, thank you very much, Frederick. Thanks, Emilian. Thank you. And. Uh,